Your spy cam is getting smarter. Bots now outnumber humans online and why it might be a good idea not to give away your DNA. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1779, recorded Wednesday, May 31st, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Oars and Alps, powerful skincare made for a guy's active lifestyle. Join thousands of men using Oars and Alps today. Go to oarsandalps.com slash twit to receive 15% off your first order. Welcome to Tech News Today. You're here, we're here. We're talking about the latest stories in technology that you need to know. Yeah. I am Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Held. Good to have you back. Thank you. I hope you. you had a fantastic time in wine country. I did. I just sat by the pool and oh, that so nice. did nothing. That sounds so nice. I recommend it for everyone. Uh, I, I, oh, I would, not now. Not a, sorry. I, I was transported to another world. Now we work. It's time to reel it back. <laughs> yes. Now we work so that we can get there another time. Mm -hmm. uh, but for right now, let's talk about Nest. Nest has been rather quiet on the new product front this past year, uh, but they now have something to show off called the Nest Cam IQ. It's a high definition security camera with a 4K HDR sensor, infrared LEDs for night vision, and a speaker with a three mic array for noise and echo reduction. The IQ in its name actually refers refers to its integration of Google's deep learning smarts for object recognition and also tracking if a threat happens to be determined. It can kind of track that object throughout its view. Uh, the onboard mics can translate sounds into alerts. If, for example, uh, a window is heard being smashed somewhere, it would recognize that thanks to deep learning and uh, and it would you know track that and sound an alarm. The Cam IQ is available for pre-order now in the US. It runs $299 for one, which is pretty pricey, or $498 for a pair. Uh, but hey, you know, Nest, Nest does this, right? They come out with these things that others are doing, but they do kind of a high style, high kind of design uh, approach to it. They've just been really quiet lately. So we're not used to seeing new products from Nest. No, I mean, I think we heard rumors about yeah. this using the artificial intelligence to, you know, be able to recognize your children and tell you when they're home. And of course, my first instinct with that is other people could also hack into your Nest uh, cam and tell you when your children are home. Yeah, they won't do that. And then encryption. Won't happen. It won't Never. happen. Never. Okay, you should knock some wood if you're going to get this camera. I'm in not your getting home. this camera. <laughs> uh, it's it's white polycarbonate shell, and it's got a glossy lens, so all mm -hmm. that will hide the fact that you're totally untrustworthy of your babysitters or your cleaning people or your children or whoever else is in your house <laughs> when you're not there. Uh, I've never liked security cameras. I have. Uh, I don't. Uh, I was going to say I don't judge, but. I do judge, <laughs> but for me- What do you not like about them? I just don't, I I don't like what they're slurping up and I don't mm -hmm. know, I don't like where that information is going and I don't like that this is connected to Google and I know they're not like immediately using this, but they, they are using their own facial recognition software to be able to determine um, all these things, mm -hmm. uh, who's a person, what's a- a um, you know a, a, a glass breaking or something like that. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I know you were just assuming, but like, I, what if I sing and it sounds like a glass is breaking? Is is an alarm gonna go off? <laughs> no, you sing and it makes the glass break. Right. And that's what sounds the alarm. <laughs> so she's singing uh, again. <laughs> oh. Um. Yeah. No, I I understand what you're saying. It's yet another connected thing. This is just this is just a recurring problem that we're going to run into time and time again when we're talking about the Internet of Things. And this is definitely another entrant into that. Uh, uh oh. Oh, man, it's it's going dark here, Brian. What is that? The eye of Sauron? Exactly. Okay. So, so let's, uh, uh, Chumley in the chat room is making a nice distinction. There's security cameras facing the outside. Right. And then there's cameras that are facing the inside, like a nanny cam. Right. And I think that I, yeah, I think that that's what I'm more concerned with. Um, especially a nanny cam, because I feel like if you're going to have someone in your home taking care of your children, cleaning your house, whatever, if you don't 
trust them, you know, well, then yeah. why are you doing that? If you don't trust them enough that you're going to be filming them, then why why are they taking care of your children anyway? That's 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 one use of this, though. Some people probably get, the, you know, I'm sure there are many people who get indoor security cameras specifically for the idea that when they're not there, if someone breaks in, they have footage, they have some sort of recourse. It's not always about tracking the people that are living there. But that's another way that people use it for sure. So mm -hmm. I guess everybody has different intentions with something like this. I don't know. I, I don't know the difference like between something like this it, with with that concern and something like the Amazon, what is it? The Amazon show, the with, show. A, with a camera there. Like it, I think they both kind of walk similar lines. Maybe this a little bit further because it's constantly kind of analyzing the video. But uh, if, if, if that is a concern, then all of these all of these devices kind of fall into that purview and it's kind of like, well, yeah, that's bad stuff can happen with these things in the, in the wrong hands. And well, yeah. I mean the Amazon show, yes, the Amazon show is for like, Oh, how does my outfit look? And you know, and I, I question it's, I, it's, I, I did not get one, um, but, <laughs> uh, but I think then like there's a pet cam like that. That's more of what I, you know, what I yeah. think is, uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, I just, I'd want, I, I would like to see what my dog is doing when I'm not at home, but then you might also collect other information on that. And that's oh, sure. more. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Burke says the cloud-based part about this is the possible issue. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good point. And I think that's a, actually a big part of what, what Megan is saying is that it's taking that video and it's sending it to the cloud, which has the benefit if you're getting it as a security camera of allowing you to kind of be notified about the these things while you're out and about. Oh, hey, it recognize you know facial recognition. It recognizes this person. And it doesn't match anyone that's in the index, so it sends me an alert. It allows these really cool things. But yet again, it's yet another vector for taking very personal information uh, from its users and putting it in the hands of mega corporations. And you know what? What are the long term ramifications of that? The potential issues from that. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty big. Yeah, and Mike in our chat room says, remember the lady in the Sixth Sense who uh, put Lysol in her kid's food and she was caught by the nanny cam? Good point, Mike. <laughs> Great. Thanks for taking it there, Mike. <laughs> you can watch live, by the way, too, twit.tv slash live. And if you want to comment, it's not just Burke who gets to comment on, yeah. on his index cards. You can, too. So yes. it's true. I hope that never happens. And I'm not, I think it's too late at that point, really. Like, you got it on camera. Great. Anyway, let's it's move better on. than not. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. So now I'm never going over to your house because I always feel like there's cameras everywhere, Jason. <laughs> Mary Meeker's annual internet trends report is out and the bots are winning. In addition to other notable stats of 2016 from the Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers exec, internet traffic from bots surpassed human generated traffic. Now this isn't the first time bots have outnumbered humans and dogs on the internet. The same thing happened in 2012 and 2013. They just seem to be meaner now. I mean, the bots, not the dogs or the people. Maybe the people are too. Here are a few other gems gleaned from the report released at Recode's Code Conference. 85% uh, of online advertising dollars now go to Google and Facebook. Data wow. breaches that expose more than 10 million uh, of our identities. There are data breaches exposed more than 10 million of our identities. We used our voice to make 20% of mobile search queries. And accuracy for those queries now hovers around 95%. And there are 2.6 billion gamers today compared to just 100 million in 1995. That's a pretty big jump right I there. I think, yeah, the, that's uh, fascinating stuff. I, I always like... Mary Meeker's report. Um, They're super dense. Mm -hmm. uh, I always like her report, yet I I never read the entire dang mm. thing because it's 300 and some odd pages. Right. You're too busy spying on people in your house, too. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> okay. I don't even have a security camera in my home. Sure. I might with says. the Nest camera. Okay. No, probably not. Um, yeah. Some other interesting uh, points from the report. Uh, wearables. We're so used to like talking and hearing about wearables and being like, oh, it's such a, a passing fad or whatever. 25% of Americans own a wearable. That's up from 12% last year. So almost doubled the amount of people who actually have wearables. And I have to imagine, you know, that's that's less about, well, I mean, it's partially about things like the Apple Watch and maybe Android Wear is in there and everything. But I think it's probably more dialed into like fitness trackers and stuff. 
like you know kind of a kind of a very specific use case watches are, are probably what a large number of that is uh, but it also shows how the trend towards tech and healthcare is actually you know, growing in a, in a lot of different ways 60% of the US is willing to share their health data with Google kind of in, in you know ties in with what we were talking about in the last story Hospitals and doctors are sharing their data with patients. Medical knowledge apparently is doubling in three and a half years now compared to every 50 years back in 1950. That's just an insane comparison right there. That is, yeah. Uh, other uh, stats, half of the most valued tech companies in the U.S. were founded by immigrants. Mm -hmm. That was interested. interesting. And 60%... Uh, of the most successful companies were founded by second generation Americans. Mm. So good uh, to know now as you know things are changing in terms of workers coming to the United States, right. and people being educated in the United States. Mm -hmm. So definitely check out the report. There's a, a whole lot more. I mean, <laughs> the thing about the report is it's a lot of just like point after point after point of these kind of eye-opening statistics, basically. So we could rattle them off all day, but it's probably better for you to just jump in there and see what you find. It's very, very eye-opening. It's looking more and more likely that Apple might have a Siri speaker up its sleeve to show off at next week's Worldwide Developers Conference. Mark Gurman and Alex Webb at Bloomberg say that manufacturing for the smart speaker has begun and though the device might be shown off on stage next week, it likely won't be ready to ship until later in the year. Apple reportedly plans to differentiate by, by including uh, virtual surround sound technology inside, along with deeply integrated functionality with other Apple products, as Apple, of course, loves to do. And they all love to do that. They all, they, you know, they're all trying for that. But Apple's really successful at that because their ecosystem is so uh, directly tied to itself. Yeah, I um I was hoping there would be a screen on it. Yeah, but it doesn't, doesn't look like, like there will. yeah, according to people who've seen it, there's no screen. Um, but I think if Ooh. yeah, the information stays on the device, uh, that that would be great. It was sort of like what you were talking about yesterday with the essential speaker. Mm -hmm. Um, that that was part of what was good about it. You know, the the all of that stuff wouldn't be out in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Um but like the Amazon Echo or the Google Home. Mm -hmm. But whether that means it would be any good, that, that's- Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big question, right? Like I, I definitely feel like when you're talking about voice assistance and digital assistance right now, there are a few key players. Siri, from, from most accounts that I hear people talking and comparing, it, you know, ends up close to the bottom on that list as far as kind of like being as effective or as responsive or or being as good with the with the uh, the wake word, you know, of, of capturing that. So Siri already, it seems like, has an uphill battle to climb when compared to the other services. The, the big benefit, of course, is that Siri in a device like this works so tightly with other Apple products in ways that the you know competition can't or doesn't or even doesn't even work with some of Apple's services like Apple Music. Mm -hmm. um, and that right there, I mean, just based on the the market, uh, you know, the Apple fan base and user base, uh, that's going to be a very appealing point of this device. Yeah, I could see this going either way. I could see it going the way of this is too late. You're, you know, you you're be you're behind and it's not smart enough like Siri or that oh, I can get Apple Music uh in my house and it sounds great on this wonderful speaker with um, surround sound. Because that is really the <laughs> I mean, I love my Amazon Echoes. I have them all over the house, but it's such a pain not to be able to listen to Apple Music yeah. and it has not made me switch to Amazon Prime Music. That that service. I just, I just haven't. Uh, and but so, do you use Spotify? Is that kind of the, the I or, use or Pandora? Pandora okay. uh, and I don't subscribe anymore. So I usually listen to it until, you know, I get an ad or two. Right. Um, or I just, uh, you know, you can say pair Bluetooth and then it pairs. Oh, so okay. It's, but and it's then just you just an extra it step. Yeah. It's just that totally. one thing that <laughs> not is as, not, not smooth. Um, but you know, I don't know if you, do you remember the the iPod Hi Fi? Oh, I remember the Hi Fi. It was three hundred and fifty dollars. It lasted less than two years. Yeah. Um, and it was this speaker. It was like a oh, you know, you can play your iPod music on this wonderful speaker. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see. First of all, what the price of this will be. Will it be three hundred fifty dollars? Will it be six hundred dollars? Who knows? Um, and 
and because I can integrate it into all of my home kit stuff, mm -hmm. which, you know, because like if you have a smart lock, let's say, you know, it integrates with home kit, but then, and it would also integrate with the Amazon Echo, but then you have to reset it up with the Amazon Echo, which is a huge pain. And does it cut off support for the other thing or can it support both at the same time? Well, I think it probably could. I, it can support yeah. both at the same time, but it's just one more step. Yeah. So if you have been using HomeKit and you've got your lock and your lights and your, you know, all your security cameras that you love so much, then you can set them. I was gonna make you, you're not gonna take the bait, are you? What? About your security cameras. No. <laughs> okay. I'm listening. <laughs> And then you can continue, okay. continue bashing me on this whole security okay. camera thing. Uh, if you have them all set up through HomeKit and then you have this device, it's seamless. Yeah. And that's what they're hoping for as opposed right. to, okay, I've set my lock up on this. Now I have to go set it up on my Amazon Echo. And yeah, so I, I really could see it going either way. Yeah, that's the Apple way is to make it a seamless experience. Um and you can totally, like, I could completely see, you know, this this is the first WWDC in a few years that it's expected to show off hardware. We talked about it a few weeks ago, MacBook, uh, improved MacBooks, MacBook Pros, uh, then, of course, the Siri speaker. It actually, in, in light of this news, makes a lot of sense that they would show it off but wouldn't release the device because they need to get developers to start working towards supporting that device for once it launches. So you show it off at the event, get developers excited, give them the tools they need, and then they develop for it. And a little bit later in the year, it launches and has all this great support right out of the box. Mm -hmm. So, Especially for all the Apple ecosystem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Directly for the Apple yeah. ecosystem. The BlackBerry Key 1 goes on sale today. It's an Android phone with a physical hardware keyboard made by BlackBerry and TCL. The $550 device is available for AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon customers. It will be available for all of us Sprint customers later this summer. BlackBerry traditionalists who've had a chance to try the Key One are fans of the hardware and the performance. The device has a 4.5 inch FHD display, Snapdragon 625 processor, 12 megapixel camera, 32 gigabyte storage, plus micro SD expansion, and a USB type C port. You can pick one up for yourself at BlackBerry's website, Amazon, and Best Buy online, or at select Best Buy stores. Is this going to be something that you add to your collection of Android phones? Uh, probably not going to own it for my for myself, though I have had a hands-on with it a week ago um, on All About Android. Our guest uh, brought it on then, Josh Vergara from Android Authority, and he had spent almost a month with it. He would like. He's like, this is my new phone. It's an awesome device. Just last night, we had Matteo Doni on. He's a repeat uh, guest on All About Android, and he had played around with it for a month, and he says the same thing. He's like, this is this is BlackBerry running Android done right. And what's so weird about that is that HMD, you know, it's not BlackBerry that's doing the hardware anymore. BlackBerry kind of exited from that, and uh, so it's, you know, the holding company, HMD. And so they got what they needed to get right right out of a blackberry device which is very appealing to you know long time blackberry users there are certain things that they loved about their devices they got the keyboard right in this case and that's a real that's been a, a big failing in any of the previous um tries even coming from actual blackberry and not hmd so uh it's pretty pretty remarkable that they kind of came out of the gate with this and made so many of those users super happy with how they they integrated everything did you swipe on the keyboard i didn't i i, I actually i mean hands-on it was very brief i didn't actually get a chance to super dive into it i just got a chance to kind of get a feel of the keyboard and because i had a blackberry years ago when when i was working at cnet and you know i got very used to kind of the feel of the keys and then some of the later blackberry that they released um, running Android, the very first ones, just didn't have the same feel. And I was like, if 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 you're going to pull people back into this hard hardware keyboard on a mobile device world, it's got to it's got to really appeal, you know, to those uh, to the the needs of those users. And it seems like they got it right here. But yeah, the swiping is really cool. It's got the fingerprint reader embedded in the space bar on the front. I don't know, a couple of cool design choices for it. Okay, so when you say get the keyboard right, is it right from just like, oh, I remember this, my love with my BlackBerry, or <laughs> is it right like it's actually more comfortable and useful and easier to type on the cat? Well, I mean, I guess right in the sense that if you have a BlackBerry and you liked it because of the keyboard, you liked it because when you picked it up, it was a comfortable typing experience and you could type fast with it 
and the kind of hardware didn't slow you down. Like mm -hmm. it's all about productivity with a BlackBerry device like this. And some of the other keyboards just didn't feel good. Like the thought of spending two years typing out all of your emails on that little touchpad, be it too flat or too flush or whatever the case may be, uh, just wasn't that great. But on some of the better BlackBerry devices, I, it's hard to explain, but when you use the keyboard, it's it's like this this like reflexive typing mm -hmm. that you get into, and the keys feel appropriate for that. And I think that's what they got really right here. And hopefully, they they duplicate that on on other efforts because it's nice it's nice to have a device that fills this void. Even though most people have moved on mm -hmm. to the touch only world, uh, it's still nice to have the hardware keyboard for those that want it. Those people who just can't move on. They can't move on. Time to move on. <sighs> no, it's not. Now you don't have to. Yep. Samsung was very excited about Bixby, its proprietary voice assistant that debuted on the Samsung Galaxy S8 a few months ago now, two months ago. Uh, so much so that it integrated a dedicated button for it into the phone, but its most impressive voice assistant functions still aren't available on the device two months after launch, and the feature isn't ready to hit U.S. users yet. Sources tell uh, tell the Wall Street Journal that the updated Bixby likely won't roll out until late June at the earliest. Samsung is now saying definitely not, you know, sometime this summer. So that puts us at least to the end of June uh, due to complications in parsing English queries effectively. I guess they had better success of parsing uh, Korean language, but but not English. It's, they're having a harder time setting up, which I mean, you, you can't you can't fault them for rushing it out. You have to get this right if you're Samsung. It's just such a bummer from Samsung's perspective to have this key feature. And going forward, you have to imagine that this is going to be a, something that they feature for the next few years while they try and ramp it up on their future devices and have just as a stilted out of the gate kind of launch for it. Because this is this is arguably the feature that you would use it for the other stuff. Like you have to ask yourself as a user and, and I, I have to fight with myself to use it because I already use assistant for all the things. Why would I use this? Uh, do you, so you haven't used the image recognition? I mean, a little bit, you're almost forced to check it out because mm -hmm. that's another kind of annoying thing about Bixby and, and basically about how Samsung kind of device, uh, designs these, their devices sometimes with software features is that it's like embedded into the camera. So when you open up your camera to take pictures, you get this little like blinky flashy thing over the top of the image that like nudges you to know that Bixby's on the case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I realize you're here to take a picture of something, but you know, you could like point it at something and it do object recognition. And I'm always here blinking around on your image. And it's just kind of, it's kind of like, all right, I get it, Sam. So you really want us to use Bixby, but leave me alone. Yeah, so maybe they fit. I mean, even the parts that do exist, it sounds like it's not a really great user experience. I mean, yeah, I mean, it. yes, it's kind of like Bixby is a little bit like Clippy in, in some ways, Burke. You're right. Um, yeah, I mean, it, sure, I'm sure it works fine. I mean, it, it also has this view that's very reminiscent of Google Now and, you know, in, or Flipboard, you know, kind of has some news items in there and everything. And it's OK, but it's just not one of those things. It's like, this is why I love this phone. And yeah. yet I think Samsung hopes that that's what this would be because mm -hmm. they want everybody to use it. And I think that's very beneficial for Samsung. If they do, they probably would have had better luck had they had this feature rolling out of the gate. Yeah. I mean, what they say, you know, it's so often the, the distance between their, um, when they show off a product or say, here's what you can do with what, you know, the reality, there's, there's often right. a, a long way. So the, ch the chair, they, they were showing off like, you know, if you go furniture shopping, like I've been looking for a good chair. So like, I would love to go to a store and see a chair and it's like that chair costs $3,000. Well, I'm not going to pay that, but I would like to, you know, I would like Bixby to take a picture of that chair and then show it to me, you know, where I can buy it for $3 or $200. <laughs> not really $3. Don't buy a $3 don't, chair. Yeah. That's yeah. You probably anyone. don't want to get that $3 chair. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like just being able to do that. But I can't think of handy. another use case for that. And you say you haven't used it at all. Well, and, and actually, now that you're talking about, about that, it makes me worry a little bit about Google's lens technology. And it was one of my fears when, when at I.O. Google showed off their AI, you know, infused... Uh, what it, well, it's called Google Lens. It's, it's basically what we're talking about. Object recognition pointed at anything and it can figure things out. The reality is, okay, if that technology is embedded in a Samsung right now and I've used it for, you know, however many months since it launched, 
yet I still don't like bring myself to find the the scenario where that feature is actually useful, mm -hmm. then kind of who cares? You right. know what I mean? It's like a neat feature. It's a neat thing to show off, but I don't know if it's necessarily revolutionary because people have to like learn when they need to use that. And I don't mm -hmm. think there are that many options in our day-to-day -day life where we think the only way I find the answer is to use image recognition on my phone. You know? Yeah, and especially if you're talking about you're holding it up to take a picture of your daughter and then it's like, you know, like, where can you buy something just like that? <laughs> where that's can you creepy. buy this daughter? <laughs> yeah, that's really creepy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, there we go. Sorry to rain on your parade, Samsung. A uh, quick reminder that you can comment on anything we discuss by emailing TNT at twit.tv. And, of course, you can always subscribe to Tech News Today by going to our show page at twit.tv slash TNT. Up next... Your friendly reminder to be aware of what the terms of service say always. But first, let's take a minute to thank Oars and Alps. They are the sponsor of this episode. I have a box of Oars and Alps right here. We're going to talk about your skin or maybe my skin, by extension, your skin. GQ calls Oars and Alps a new essential for your daily routine. It's powerful skincare made for a guy's dehydrated skin and active lifestyle. Because you know us guys, we don't do a good job of taking care of our skin. It's kind of an afterthought. Uh, so that's what Ours and Alps is all about. Uh, they have the face cleansing stick, which I'll go ahead and show you here real quick. I have three products here. But this is, I, I would say, the, the most interesting, kind of the coolest, and maybe you've never done this, bef used a product like this before. The face cleansing stick is the first men's solid face wash. You kind of, you put it on your skin, make sure and cover it as charcoal. It's spill proof, activated charcoal that, that exfoliates your skin pulls impurities you just rinse it off with water and it's good to go it's very good for just like throwing into your gym bag that sort of thing a uh, two-in-one hydrating and anti-aging eye and face cream right here uh non-greasy fast absorbing no nonsense natural deodorant as well which is i'm getting lost in boxes and products here uh but there you go uh Nour nourishes your skin, absorbs odor, which is what you want a good deodorant to do, of course. Everything is super portable and TSA approved. You just throw it in your bag and go. Uh, it's made with powerful and natural ingredients that offer intense hydration. It's great for your skin. Products last up to three months. Oars and Alps products were developed by two women, Laura and Mia, for their husbands. They partnered with leading chemists and created Oars and Alps to protect their husband's skin from extreme outdoor conditions that often resulted in dry, cracked skin. And if you're an act, if you have an active lifestyle, you know exactly, uh, uh, exactly about that scenario. Laura and Mia also set out to solve a common problem, spilled product in gym bags. So they created the first solid face wash for men that you can just throw in, like I said, and it's not going to spill. Products are perfect to take on the go, gym, work, travel, or your next adventure. Maybe you're traveling to the Alps. Uh, their name was inspired by their husband's favorite outdoor activities, oars, as in rowing, Alps, as in skiing. But you can take it anywhere, and it won't set you back. Uh, and, oh, by the way, Father's Day, right around the corner. As a father, hey, this is a good gift. So, you know, think about that as well. Oars and Alps is offering the Twit audience a fresh start to your day. Join the thousands of guys using Oars and Alps. All you got to do is visit oarsandalps.com slash twit. You'll receive 15% off your first order. That's Oars and Alps, O-A-R-S-A-N-D-A-L-P-S, oarsandalps.com slash twit. And we thank Oars and Alps for their support. Many of us are playing pretty fast and loose these days with who we're sharing some of our personal information with. But what about your DNA? Who owns yours? Consumer protection lawyer Joel Winston recently wrote a medium piece about the terms of service for Ancestry.com, and he's here to talk about his concerns. Welcome to the show, Joel. Thanks for having me, Megan. So An Ancestry DNA promises to uncover your ethnic mix, help you discover distant relatives, and find new details about your unique family history with a simple DNA test. But you recently dug into their terms of service, which caused some concern. Uh, what were you wary about when you read it? Um, yeah, thanks. I think I'm getting too much credit. I didn't dig in so much as I just read the terms of service. <laughs> that's that's, that's, more, that's more than most yeah. people do. Exactly. I would yeah, classify right? that as digging so in. Everybody hits click to agree, but nobody reads what they're clicking to agree. <laughs> so we took a look at what was in there, and it turns out there's a couple of provisions that are favorable to Ancestry.com and less favorable to their customers. 
So the chief privacy officer, Eric Heath from Ancestry.com, he responded to your post and then revised the terms of service. Uh, what do you think about the revisions that he made? So I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, the blog post that he posted doesn't have any legal effect on the terms of service or the privacy policy or the informed consent agreement that customers sign when they purchase an Ancestry DNA test service and kit. The information in the blog is more of a public relations response um, to try to get people on the same page about what they're doing, but they're not really providing a truthful and transparent response to consumers about how they're monetizing that DNA data. Yeah, I guess that's the big question, right, is if they have it built into the terms of service. I know a lot of times with, with terms of service, they play it kind of, they, they play it almost loose to the point where it's like, yeah, we, we have control over this, though we're not spelling out exactly how we're going to use it, but that gives us freedom to, you know, figure that out later, and you never really know exactly what's happening to it. Um, in this case, I mean, is there any indication as far as what could actually be done with this type of ownership over your DNA at this point? Yeah, so we do know that Ancestry is selling the DNA data, both the aggravated, the aggregated data, the um, DNA, raw DNA samples, and possibly individualized data to for-profit research groups, to pharmaceuticals, and other entities. Ancestry has promised that in the future, they will not sell to health insurance companies, to employers, or to other third-party marketers. But according to the terms of the co their legal contract within the terms of, of service, they still have the right to make those sales. They were also parsing the language a little bit. You know, your blog post said they own your DNA. And what they were saying was they, they're really just licensing it. And the, mm -hmm. the, the terms of service says uh, that it's they have a transferable license to host, transfer, process, analyze, distribute and communicate your genetic information for the purposes of providing you products and services. So from a legal perspective, can you talk a little bit about what the difference, if there is any, between owning and licensing? Absolutely, there's a fine legal distinction between a perpetual worldwide royalty-free license to your DNA versus ownership of your DNA. Um, of course, they don't have exclusive ownership of your DNA because it's still in your body. So you still own your DNA. They don't have an absolute ownership of your DNA because the terms of service allow any of the customers to withdraw their consent during the period of their life. But they do take a license to analyze and to sell your DNA. And so the distinction between whether they own it or they license is lost on 99% of the public because the license allows them to do basically all of the things of ownership. And I mean, is there, I mean, over the lifetime, you know, I mean, that's obviously a very long time. Uh, what, what can someone do to retract that? And is it a clean break at that point? I mean, are, if they decide after agreeing to the terms of service and that DNA information changes hands, is it there in perpetuity? They can only protect themselves so far, but not entirely. Yeah, that's a good question. The terms of service is the legal contract that controls the use of the data. And the contract is what gives the customers the right to request that their data be deleted. So because the contract allows the data to be deleted, a customer can request that the data can be deleted. If Ancestry were to change those terms and no longer allow people to withdraw their consent, then you might lose control over your data. Um, here, the contract allows you to withdraw your consent, and if you take a couple of additional steps, you can request that your your actual raw sample be fully deleted, and Ancestry promises to do that and to carry it out. So when I am on Facebook and, you know, liking things and posting things, posting pictures, you know, th those are things that I'm handing over to Facebook and, you know, they're, they're mine, uh, presumably. But when you're talking about handing over your DNA, there's, you know, your DNA is very unique, but then part of it is unique to other people as well. So what privacy concerns are there when you're talking about uh, really trying to figure out who your ancestors are? Are you also handing over your ancestors' DNA? Or not your ancestors, but people, people who might be related to you. Yeah, interestingly, you could be handing over your descendants' DNA. So your great-granddaughter may have trouble getting a life insurance policy based on the DNA that you turn over today. 
So a lot of these things down the road and in the future may be speculative, but we do know today that DNA can be used for law enforcement purposes. It can be used for insurance underwriting purposes, either in life insurance or possibly in health insurance if the protections against pre-existing conditions are removed. There are also certain instances in which your employer can acquire portions of this information. So there is a patchwork of state and federal legislation that provides privacy rights uh, but the right to privacy is not absolute. Yeah, and you talk a little bit um, in your piece about informed consent, about how that information somewhere down the line could be handed over to authorities in an investigation, let's say. Um, and so, I mean, the damage, the damage potentially long term is pretty severe. It's not just information, which we're used to kind of trading willy nilly on the on the Internet. It's your DNA. And that can link up to a whole lot of things outside of just the digital world. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to be very clear that what Ancestry is doing is completely legal. There's no accusations that they've done anything illegal. Um, but the honest truth of the matter is that consumers need to be aware of these right, these terms and services that they're signing, the rights that they're giving away. It's Most of them just don't understand because these are terms written by a lawyer and it takes other lawyers to decipher what the terms mean. So consumers are really at a disadvantage. Um, so it's incumbent upon services like Ancestry.com to be fully and completely transparent about how they intend to monetize the data. Um, so it's similar to the situation we saw a couple of weeks ago with Unroll Me, uh, where people didn't understand that by giving access to their inbox to somebody else, that their emails and other information about them could be sold to third parties. Yeah, I mean, so it's really I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say transparency is one thing, but... Um you know, people actually taking the time to dive in and read it is is another challenge entirely, which I think a lot of people, and I'm I'm fully you know guilty of this myself. You just see those. T I mean, you've seen a million of them. We've we've agreed to a million TOS screens uh, because we use a lot of things. We use a lot of services. We're just kind of used to uh, clicking the accept box. Um, there are services like uh, what is it? TOSDR.org, which stands for Terms of Service Didn't Read dot org, uh, that basically crowdsource kind of the analysis of TOS. Do you think those do a good job of kind of bridging the gap, helping people to kind of find information without having to read every single word of a term of service? Yeah, it's important to provide ways for people to understand these and nobody should feel necessarily guilty about this. These legal contracts are extensive and they're everywhere. Your grandparents may never have agreed to a contract like this maybe once in their life if they applied for a mortgage, but we're confronted with this multiple times every day through every app that we use, even every website that you visit, just by landing on that website and clicking around, you're agreeing to an extensive legal contract. And it's important to note that these contracts allow the companies to update them at any time they see fit and as they please. So like what happened here with Ancestry, they went by themselves and updated the terms of service. So now everybody who's an Ancestry customer is obligated to go back to those terms and reread them and decide again if they want to accept them or reject them. So as a privacy attorney, would you say that if you if you happen to read a terms of service agreement and it says that a company can sell your, your data, even if you know you talk to them and they say we're, we're not doing it, would you just recommend that people just assume that every company will who says they they can in their terms of service? Yeah, I would say that you cannot take anybody at face value. You cannot trust a blog post. As a lawyer, the only thing that matters is the language of the legal contract, especially when the legal contract specifically says only this legal contract applies and no writing or speaking outside of this contract will have any effect. So you, it's up to the individual and consumers to share this information, to ask companies that they do business with for more transparency about how their data is being used and to take an active role in managing the release of their own data. So you are on Twitter at Medical Report. Are, are, is a lot of your privacy related work related to people sharing their uh, medical information? Yes. So originally, if you remember, before Obamacare kicked in and pre-existing conditions were eliminated, um, it was quite common for health insurance companies to underwrite applicants based on their own medical history. And there are actually a number of providers that provide basically a credit report for your health, which is a medical report. 
just like a free credit report you might get when you want to apply for a credit card. There are similar credit reports that contain information about your prescriptions, your doctor's visits, your ailments, um, your risky hobbies, all types of information about you that you may consider to be particularly sensitive, but that companies have access to when you apply to do business with them. So it's not just a matter of protecting privacy for privacy's sake, but the information in your files could actually cost you money or even cost you the ability to purchase a policy. Well, Joel, thank you so much for joining us. Joel Winston is at Medical Report on Twitter. Is there any other place where people can follow you online? Um, Twitter is a great place. You can also um, check out my law firm website and um, find me on Medium. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, you can, Joel. Of thank course, you. read this piece uh, on on Medium, which is as well on Think Progress. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Have a great night. All right, feedback time. Catherine writes about Uber and price discrimination, which we spoke about yesterday. She says, I have an economics background and work in market risk. The thing about price discrimination is that only monopolies or colluding oligopolies can accomplish it successfully. Say Uber perfectly price discriminates based on willingness to pay. And there is another service available, say Lyft, that does not price discriminate. On average, over time, the higher income consumers will choose Lyft and lower income people will choose Uber. This would drastically shift the consumer base for Uber out of their favor. The only way to successfully price discriminate is if there is collusion ensuring that a competitor does not undercut your pricing. Lyft's optimal strategy in this scenario is to price match just under Uber's pricing. If they actually price match, then we are in a world of hurt because once that happens, the price of a ride is only going to rise. Very good perspective. Yeah, I love the, I mean, economics is really interesting when you yeah. think about it and people's behavior. And you got to wonder if they are colluding in some way uh, on purpose or just as we've heard about using certain technology to be able to, you know, pretend to be a customer trying to see what, you mm -hmm. know, you would uh, be charged to ride an Uber or a Lyft. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I would not be surprised if that is the, the future trouble that these companies get into, yeah. as Amazon did. I mean, uh, collusion means that there's cooperation between competitors. Um, do you see Lyft and Uber palling up to for, for a combined goal like this? Oh, uh, I don't know if it <laughs> meant to. No, I mean, I think what it I, I think it makes sen more sense for Lyft to just undercut them. Yeah. Um, and that's why they keep their data. So, you know, yeah, that's so why we don't know whether they're doing something like this. Right. Or not. <laughs> exactly. Because someone would. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. we'll see. TNT's fan of the day is Kyle Ko, who sent us this video on Twitter saying he's on the street in Shinjuku, Tokyo. Should we listen to it and play it? I don't know if we get much sound other than ambient noise. But he says the girls were laughing at him for holding a phone while filming it and walking. So we appreciate it. Uh, oh, oh, I heard the laugh. <laughs> it's okay. We appreciate you taking one for the team, Yeah, Kyle, Kyle thank you. It was <laughs> worth it uh, for us. Yes. Maybe those girls are also listening and laughing at what we were saying. Uh, it's possible, although there were headphones coming out of that phone, so I don't think they heard. I think they mm -hmm. just saw someone walking around with their phone in the air, which, I don't know, isn't that weird? No, well, I mean, he had to have another phone. That's you, true. That's okay, what, that is a little weird. All right, weird. all right. We appreciate it, Kyle. <laughs> uh, please look as weird as you possibly can yes. while you are showing us how you watch or listen to TNT. Record a video, take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT. And if someone is laughing at you while you're doing it, that you, we are more likely to show it on the show. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Embrace that. Yes. And send it to us, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you were thinking about getting some of Tesla's shiny solar roof tiles on your McMansion, good news. The product received a Class A roofing product classification, meaning installations will face less resistance and could begin as early as next month. Tesla opened up for orders beginning early May uh, for the solar roof tiles. Those tiles will cost around $21.85 uh, $21 per square foot include a lifetime warranty along with a guarantee of at least 30 years of power generation. I put this in here because I just, I love these things and I actually want them. I don't know whether I will ever actually end up getting them on our home. They basically say, they point out in this article on Electric that these specific tiles are particularly good if you already need a new roof, if mm -hmm. you need to, you know, put a new roof up and you're thinking about going solar 
in that case, I mean, the tiles, as they said when they announced these months ago, are comparable, if not less expensive than uh, than traditional roof tiles. So you might as well, if, if you're already going to replace your roof, if you, if you don't need to replace your roof, go with the traditional solar panels, uh, that, that would be good enough. Do you need to replace your roof? Uh, I think our roof probably has another 10-ish years. So not right now, but 10 years from now, hey, these, this technology is going to get better and better. So there we go. If you're going to wait 10 years to get solar, think about, we might even not that's, that's have a good point. any that's, that's electricity a good point. by then. We might not even exist by then. <laughs> we but. might not. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we just moved into a brand new house um, and we, uh, my husband is meeting with a solar person oh. as we speak. Seriously, yeah, nice. We had solar panel panels on our last house it's really hard to look at it i mean they're expensive and then it's complicated like do i rent or do you buy and you keep right. having to tell yourself that you're doing good yeah. for the world yeah <laughs> well and and like i know with with solar city and and i'm sure a lot of the other solar companies like it's expensive but they like i don't understand the math behind it but they kind of they, they set it out so that it, it kind of pays for itself over time and or that's that what they stuff. would have you believe. That's it's that's the marketing that I, yes, and that if, I understand at this point. I don't know whether to believe it or not. Right. But. And just a word of warning, if you are interested in Solar City, I mean, just make sure you're really interested because once you contact them, they are never going to stop contacting you. They're never going to stop. Yes, that super friendly <laughs> guy is going to just call you every day as he did me. We're not going with Solar City. Yeah. For reasons I'm happy to explain if someone wants to email me at Megan at TV. There we go. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300. UTC at twit.tv slash live. Be part of the show always by emailing us tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can also find us at our subreddit. We're just hanging out there. We oh, yeah. set up some lawn chairs. Couch. Yeah, we got a couch. I'm in a lawn chair. Yeah. Jason's in a couch. couch. Technewstoday.reddit.com. You can upvote stories, downvote stories, add some stories. We check it out and we we are there every day. And if you want to tweet at me, I am also on Twitter. I'm at Megan Maroney. And don't forget to subscribe to the show, twit.tv slash TNT. That's an important one. Uh, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Brian Burnett. Thanks to Burke for helping out here in the studio. Thanks to Kevin for editing the show. And thanks to you. That's right. I'm pointing at you for talking tech with us today. You. We'll see you tomorrow, you. Okay? And now we high five. <laughs> <laughs>